I'd like to talk to you about what happened tonight. What do you think happened? Well, I know I got left behind on purpose. That was for your own best interest. You don't know a goddamn thing about my best interest. You know, Murphy, what happens out there isn't really for everyone. But it is for Pena. You're not Pena. Because I'm a damn gringo. Because I trust him. Why don't you try me? This fight against Escobar, you want to win it. These guys aren't fighting by the same rules, so why should we? You know what that means? Oh, I do. So whether this is about protecting me or protecting you, stop icing me out. Thanks, everybody. Hello, hey, hello. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Season two. Whoop, whoop. Were you, I mean, the first season was incredible. It was so densely packed with information and would you say direct, like totally based on a true story or sort of like loosely based on the true story? Um, you know, the show is, is pretty accurate. I, the only thing that I would say is that the timelines of, of, of things have been a, a little scattered just to make a narrative sort of move more Make smooth. it a watchable show. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, it's highly accurate. I mean, I think they have a narcopedia right now. Wow. Because the... <clears throat> One of the things that Narcos was, uh, the people from Narcos was, were telling me is that they would have like huge surges of, of Wikipedia going up because of after the show of a certain thing that happened, people going back and checking it out, and um, it was true. People trying to figure out the facts versus the show, and then kind of sort yeah. of letting people know everything, what yeah. everything was. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. And isn't Steve uh, Murphy the the guy that you play? He's he's based on a, a real guy, right? Absolutely, Steve Murphy is alive and well. And he was on. He, I mean, he was on set a little bit for the first season, wasn't he? Uh, he came down the last. Um, I think the last couple of episodes, and um, him and his wife, you know, Steve, really did uh, adopt two young girls from Colombia. Wow. Um, so again, you know, there's Olivia in, in the show. There's only one girl. That just makes it a lot easier for shooting and babies and. Well, what was it like for him to sort of see the show and see you as him when it when it finally aired? And did you have any conversations with him about? Did he? Do you know when you met him? You're like, I'm Boyd. I'm going to be playing you. Was he like, <laughs> All right. Um, you know, I think Steve was just tickled to for everything to happen. You know, just really, 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 really tickled about it. Um, and then once the show came out, and obviously. You know, everyone enjoying it so much. I think it just made him that much more engaged. Uh, I was I was terrified at the beginning to play someone, a real life person. Um, but at one point, I just had to give that away and just do my own thing. Were you terrified at all to sort of play such a big part on on such a long, such a sort of a show with so much depth? I mean, you your first role was in Milk, which wasn't wasn't that long ago. Yeah, it was like a, a walk. I was like a. Oh, where's Waldo in, in Milk? Um, There's a great story behind how you got that part that I'd, that I'd love for you to share if you could. <clears throat> yeah, I think so. I, you know, I, I just moved to New York, maybe had been there a, a year or two, and I'd written a script um, sort of about this Appalachian crime family where I'm from, and I gave it to Gus Van Sant, thinking that he uh, would direct it, um, which he did show some interest in, but... Wow. Uh, he's, he told me, you know, Boyd, I'm actually doing this film with Sean Penn. Um, maybe you can be involved. So that's how that came about. Um, and, you know, with, with Narcos, you know, as an actor, you're not really, well, I wasn't. Um, I wasn't really scared of it. I was really waiting for something, you know. When am I going to really start working? Or if I ever am. So... I mean, that's, I guess that's the only thing I was afraid of, if, if, I, if I'm just going to be, you know, a bum. <laughs> Did it feel like before Narcos that you were kind of doing like a small part here, a small part sure. there, and now Absolutely. this is your chance to kind of really sink your teeth into Absolutely. something? Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. I did a, you know, in any career that anyone has, maybe out in the audience, you know, you, you sort of climb your way up the ladder. For me, it was a lot of like that. It was a lot of smaller parts. I personally have chosen uh, smaller characters with uh, great content, great filmmakers. 
which is yeah. actually m almost much harder to do than to just. Yeah, I mean, you can jump on any sort of teams, you know, whatever the current trend is, and get in those vehicles. Um, but uh, we, and me, we uh, we really tried to decipher and, and, and move through it and find like really quality characters that ha that you can do something with. I have a feeling this has something to do with the fact that you yourself are a film school grad, that you're a script writer, that you seem to be a sort of art and specifically a, a film lover and want to be a part, uh, want to contribute good work. Yeah, I think with, with film, you know, in any sort of medium of, of art, I think your job as an artist is to is to communicate. If you're making a painting or if you're making a sculpture, um, your job is to communicate to the audience what your concept or what your ideal is. Um, and film has such an expansive reach. I mean, you look at Netflix. I mean, they're in every country except for China, North Korea. Um. <laughs> <laughs> With good reason. With good reason, yeah. All of those. So... When you have that opportunity, you you really are obligated, I think, in my opinion, as an artist, to 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 really be loyal to that to to that medium and and take responsibility and and do a lot because first of all, it's impossible to get something made, and why would you? You know, you you look at the numbers on these big box office films. Which is fine, you know. They're, they're, you're spending money, making money. It's, it's all it's all commerce, which is great. But if you have the opportunity to get message a message out, such as strong as what we're doing in Narcos, then that's a different story. You you, you really can extend a conversation of of a global issue, which you know, obviously the cocaine trade, the, uh, you know, the drug trade industry which is making billions of dollars and funding terrorism and, you know, in many countries. Uh, you, ha you know, I, I look at that opportunity and feel blessed. Absolutely. One of the things that Narcos does is it sort of tells the beginning of the story of cocaine's mm -hmm. global reach and at the same time the drug wars Yes. global, global yeah. reach, and how the economy of both sort of affect each other and affect the world in different ways. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Now, uh, I want to go back to something that you brought up, which is the script that you wrote about an Appalachian crime family, because I'm, I'm curious what... what making me sweat. I know, I apologize. What, Hot up here. What, hap what happened to it? Do you still sort of rewrite it? Do you still pitch it? Do you have intention oh, to direct anything yourself? Absolutely, yeah. I, you know, I've, I founded a company with um, a very dear friend of mine, Madeline Sackler, uh, we have a company called Madbrook, and our sort of diagnostic, our sort of uh, quote for the company is, you know, how impossible it is to get these things made, then why not make something of substance? You know, she just finished making a film in a maximum security prison um, with 90% of the cast are, are inmates. So you, amazing. you look at our incar in incarceration rate, which is 2.3 million people in this country, it's a lot of people. That's uh, you know, Denmark has about four million people in this in this country. So there's something going on, and something's not really working. Now, are you going to change anything? Most likely not. But you can create a conversation, or you can be of the conversation, which can continue, which can ultimately shift things. And I hope that, that can happen. Absolutely. So you you've made some short films. You're gonna you're gonna sort of direct a film possibly with in, at this company when you get some time. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. Is that? Do you feel like you're you're ready for that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I've 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 you know specifically sought out certain directors to see how they're doing their work. Everyone works differently. If you gave ten films to ten different directors, you would get ten different films. And that's you know the the authenticity of it, of every individual that can work on something. Um, so for me, um, I've been sort of you know just from a, from a nice distance in a very intimate way, seeing how they work. You know, I think it's really it's really smart to always work with someone smarter than you. How does that work for you on Narcos, where you have different no one's smarter than me on, on Narcos? No. <laughs> 
<laughs> where you have different directors per on different episodes, yeah. you know? Yeah. And, yeah, yeah, do, yeah. Are you still sort of learning and picking up from them, or is Narcos the kind of situation where, you know, you have such a, a character which, uh, with a long breath that you kind of focus more on, uh, on the character work when you're on set? Well, sorry, I'm sweating so much. Um, we, Jose Bajila is, um, He's a Brazilian director. Is where this, the um, aesthetic of our show comes from. The the docu documentary style of shooting, the radicalness, um, all that goes into play in the filmmaking. So the film, the, the, that's the cinematography. That's what was sort of the constant flu, uh, through line in the show. Um, but we would have, I think, we had five directors per season directing two episodes at once. Wow. Yeah. Now, you have two movies coming out in the next month, right? You have The Free World, which premiered at Sundance, and you have uh, Morgan, right? Which is directed by, I believe, uh, is it Ridley Scott's son? <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait to be known as, as that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he doesn't have any big, he doesn't have any shoes to fill at all. He's like fine. My, um, Acted by Don Holbrook's son, <laughs> which is my dad. <laughs> Talk to me about this movie, Morgan. It looks to be a little bit like uh, maybe this year's Ex Machina. That's a really good way to put it, which I've seen. Um, I mean, you know, his Luke Scott, Luke Scott, excuse me, um, is a really great director. He's been doing, I think uh, he did Second Unit of, second unit of Prometheus. Um, no, it was a really interesting script. I've never kind of done anything sort of that side of the coin with sci-fi, stuff like that. Um, but the cast is phenomenal. You have Paul Giamatti, Kate Mara, um, so many talented other people that I'm just drawing blank on because they're so talented. Do you have any scenes with Giamatti? I don't know. Oh man, that's no. the actor where I feel like you could. But really we're in Belfast, so I bought him a Guinness. So <laughs> we had a Guinness together. That was fun. And talk to me about the free world, where you're acting alongside uh, the great, the the national treasure, Elizabeth Moss. Oh wow! I hope she watches that and hears that. You know, I've called it to her. I've said it to her face. Oh, good, good man, good man. Um, you know, you can do a lot of different types of films, but or different budgets, or whatever it may be. Um, but The Free World is, it was very timely. It came out during Making a Murder, which um, my character, Muhammad uh, Mundi, was released through the Innocence Project. And again, going back to the incarceration rate of so many of these, so many men being incarcerated, there has to be a number of men that are wrongly accused. So, Muhammad, uh, changed his name to Muhammad in prison because he was, he converted to Allah and converted to Islam. Um, a, a person who was stripped of his personality, um, convicted of killing these two little girls, which he did not do. And um, in prison, he found an, an, a new personality and he channeled through that way. Uh, and then when he's out, he's sort of an outcast of the so uh, society. And he's trying to rebuild his life when people just keep going after him. And you see this almost, you know, it's almost comical um, about his luck. So I found that really interesting. A, a guy, you know, that's, for me as an actor, I like to play things that are very foreign to me. You know, I want to have a journey myself of learning about something completely different. You know, where there's a lot of very touchy issues today going on with Islam and the rest of the world. And Islam is, is a religion that's based in peace. And so, you know, I was praying five times a day, I read the Quran, and that was very important to me. You know, when so many people are talking about so many things about this religion, and, and it's just a confusion which there will continue to be a confusion, but again, you're more educated on the conversation to have one. So 
That film was very important to me, and uh, I hope everyone has a look at it. It's important, I think, uh, it's important to know that the word Islam is in reference to, or it is a religion. It's not the way so many people use it in politics, which is a way that I think confuses a lot of people. Absolutely. And it, is, it, is, it is prayer, it is peace, it is not uh, what it is so often referred to in our culture. <laughs> absolutely, yeah. Absolutely. Uh, you also have a credit, and I gotta ask, because I ask anybody on stage who's in one of his movies in a Terrence Malick movie, <laughs> in Weightless. <laughs> yes. Do you, do you know if 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 you've made it into the into the final film? Yeah, I got a call that I wasn't cut out of the movie. Which, if for those of you who don't know, that's like a, a miraculous feat to not be cut out of the Ter a Terrence Malick yeah, movie. Yeah, but I don't really think I'm in the movie that much. <laughs> Yeah, there's been some horror stories of, of people who've been on Malick films, and, you know, it's just the way it works. Um, it's kind of sink or swim. He has probably a 500-page script. Uh, you know, and he figures, he, he films it all, and then he'll get into the editing, editing booth and, and basically make his film that way. What kind of, did you have any questions about your character? I've heard wonderful stories of, like, what do you want me to do? What's my character? And he will essentially sometimes go, it's you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> Just tell me what to do. <laughs> Does he tell you what to do? No. No. <laughs> What's that like for you as an actor who's also trying to pick up tools of the trade from directors? Is that a tool that you can pick up? Or do you just say to yourself kind of like, this guy's do he's on his own plane, I'll, you know? You know, I, I think... You know, Terrence Malick is by far one of the most important filmmakers to ever live. Um, it, uh, yeah, it's it's sink or swim, like I said before. And you know, I went to drama school, so improving and having a good time and and all this stuff that that's fun for me. Um, but at a certain point, you know, uh, you know, turn the lights on a little bit. <laughs> I'm in the dark, but it was a blast, and um, you know I, I'm just so thankful for that experience. To be honest, I'm Chris. You know, you're you said you're from Appalachia, in is it Kentucky? Yeah, I'm from Eastern Kentucky, a little county called Floyd County. How did you <clears throat> start acting? What what you know? Where did you get the bite to become an actor? What happened? Um, How did you get plucked out of there? Well, I, I wrote a lot when I was a kid. Um, I drew a lot. Uh, I was in some, you know, programs for, for that when I was a kid. But, uh, you know, it wasn't really a lot. You know, the dominating force of where I'm from is coal mining. You know, my father has worked in and around the coal industry for about 40 years. Uh, I moved to Louisville, Kentucky to go to college. I dropped out of college. Um, started working at a department store in Lexington, Kentucky for all those out there. <laughs> um, you got nothing on that one, yeah, sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, I met, a, I met Michael Shannon in a department store, and I, I recognized him from Vanilla Sky. And I Another asked, national treasure, Michael Shannon. Uh, phenomenal. I think his mom's from Lexington. And so, you know, very naive, very green. I went up to him and asked him, you know, how do you do what you do? I, I was wanting to become a writer and a director and really having no concept of what that actually meant, but just being um, just a, such a fan. So he said, get into the theater. So I quit my job probably that day, the next day. I called my sister. I said, okay, I've got to go to the theater. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and she's like, actually, I know someone in theater. I know a lighting guy. Um, and get you a job this summer. So I started working at this theater company and I worked there for about probably eight months, building sets, you know, running the sound at shows and being one of these guys or something like that. And um, I, some, some lady came by the, by the show. She said, let me take a photo of you. I said, what for? She said, modeling. I said, what's that? And I swear to God, I really didn't really, really know. Um, anyways, I got a, a ticket to New York about three months later, and I had a cousin in Hoboken. I lived on her couch, and uh, I didn't leave. I left her house. <laughs> I left her house. I left you were, her house. You were that guy. You... <laughs> no, nah, I left her house, and I paid her 100 bucks like two months ago, so that's fine. <laughs> that's 
that's incredible. That's also, I mean, uh, not not the photo or anything, but that that's similar to Michael Shannon's story, which is that like I think he moved to Chicago and started sleeping at a theater and 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 got his start that way. Yeah, Michael's story is way cooler than mine. <laughs> but um, you know, that's I think that's just, when you're. 20 or 18 or I mean my god 28 years old it doesn't really matter you can put up with a lot and um, it's almost like having a, a uh, like a psychotic drive yeah. where you don't really know stop you are like the energizer bunny you get punched in the face and you come back up and they punch you again and they come back up and they punch you again and you come back up eventually they're just tired of punching you and like, okay, come on, come in. Uh, I'm going to open up to the audience for questions. Does anyone have any questions out there? Uh, hi, my name is Marisa. I'm from Brazil. So. Hey. Hi. Uh, we can see in the show that the violence increase. And uh, so, um, so Pablo Escobar and your character, they both getting younger. And what I want to know is how you like left everything behind after you finish the recording? How is your mind working on it? Um, you know, I think Wagner is a really good example of that. Wagner is one of the most intelligent people I've ever met in my life. He plays Pablo Escobar, Wagner Moore, the great Wagner Moore. Um, he went on a vegan diet. I went on a, a motorcycle trip through Patagonia. You know, it's, it's the same thing, I guess, in a different version. Vacation. Yeah, but run it out of you, you know, and you're really right about that. You know, we were in Colombia for about nine months. Um, I probably lost about 30 pounds. No offense to Colombia, but just the conditions of we were working, we were pioneering through the film industry. There wasn't really that happening. So, I mean, we were working six days a week, 14 hours a day, sleeping you know, on Sunday just for 24 hours. So I, I, um, I'm I, big, I like to ride bikes. And me and my buddy, we went to Santiago and we went to Ushuaia in Argentina. We went to all through Chile and I had the time in my life. And after that, I felt like a million bucks. Next question. Uh, hello. Hey. Um, so your character is based on a real person like you mentioned earlier. Yes. How much creative freedom do you give yourself and do the people who create the show give you to portray this person while still staying true to the actual person and events? Uh, that's so long. Um, you know, hmm, how do I say this right? Uh, <laughs> you know, the show is extremely ac accurate. I will say that. <clears throat> it was really... You know, everyone has a department. The writer has, the writers have their department of, of just figuring out the massive puzzle of it all. And then the director has a way to, his, his, figure, him figuring out to how, to sh how am I going to shoot this. And, you know, if sometimes when you get scripts, the voice is written into, I mean, I'm just talking about the phrasing, if you're from California to um, Kentucky, yeah, people speak differently. So... Uh, Pedro and I, we always tried to work in our characters, and, and we were really given a lot of freedom. And actually, I'll, you know, I should tip my hat to ne uh, Netflix for that because I've talked to a lot of people who work on Netflix shows, and they just really make good hires, and they let you do your thing rather than a lot of. Studios, and, I'm, and I can't say that I've had this experience myself, but, you know, controlling over your shoulder, uh, all this, that, that's not a good situation to be in. So, and thank God, you know, we we're very far away. So we could do kind of what we wanted to do. And uh, we would just check in with each other. You sure? You sure? I have to ask before I move on to the next question. Uh, is it true that you got cast recently in a big superhero movie? <laughs> I have no idea what you're talking about. Um, may have, yeah. <laughs> Depending on anything that you can say about it. Um, yeah, I was, I was like, yeah, I was cast in, in Wolverine. Um, I don't know what they're going to call it yet. Um, 
Yeah. I've heard. I've heard that it's. I've heard that it's the villain. The role of the villain. It, it is. It is. It is. Yes. Yes. Congratulations, man. That's a Thank big. That's much. a big deal. Was that like a huge process? Thanks. Thanks. Was that a huge process for you to sort of get that role? It was, you know, it, it was so funny. I, the only other uh, sort of Northern American that was working with me down in Narcos was this guy named Jeff. And I hope to God he sees this because he's going to, like, p piss his pants. Um, <laughs> but we did the audition for, for Wolverine. And it was just one night. Um, I don't know. I just went for it, did something. And then, like, a month and a half, two months later, I get the call, like, so you've been offered the job of, of this villain in Wolverine. I'd completely forgotten about it because it was just in, you know, a really big thing. Um, it was just so bizarre because I think it has to go through so many, again, through so many people. I remember <clears throat> going up to Hugh, I really wanted to meet Hugh, Hugh Jackman. And um, he's like, oh, I might love, totally loved the audition. It was great. Loved it. Loved it. Love what you're doing with the character. And I was like, and I was just no idea what he was talking about. I was like, how? And then it dawned on me, oh, my God, so many people had to see this to right. get by. Right. At, a, at a certain point, it's the kind of thing where Hugh's been with the role yeah, for so absolutely long. Absolutely so. He's, he's got to say, and absolutely. director's got to say, producer's got to say. And then you yes. even have, like, I mean, Congratulations! Like the marketing department had had a say as well. <laughs> right, 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 right. Yeah, great. We can sell this kid. He looks good. Chin tuck, eyes back. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think so. I mean, yeah. I mean, and right. I was saying rightly so. I mean, Hughes. Uh, he. I mean, he made that franchise, and I think he should have. And you know, if I was him, I would too. Absolutely. Well, congratulations on that, man. I'm looking Thank forward you. to it. Thank you. Let's uh, take one more question. Hi. Hey. Um, since you and your friend now have your own company, mm -hmm. are there any people in history you would like to play, or is there a story that you've read that you would like to see bring to screen? Uh, put to screen? Absolutely. Absolutely. We're, I think we've acquired maybe like three books, uh, a life right here and there. Um, yeah, there's a lot of stuff because you know, for me, it, it's I don't want to be dependent on someone else giving me a job. You know, I have to wait for a great script, a great director, and maybe win the chance at, at getting the role, which is kind of like bummer, bummer, bummer. And you know, I would like just to make my own stuff, and I think that's actually more interesting. It's a little bit harder. Uh, but yeah, we're we're definitely trying to put some some more unique things out in the world. How do you find the time to write when uh, I know that you're a writer? How do you find the time to write when you're doing a lot of these projects? Like, for instance, when you're shooting Narcos for would you say like six months, three three four months? Um, I, Narcos is a nine month gig. Nine months. Yeah. So, do you end up just not being able to write during the during the course of that time? You know. It was funny, the less I worked before Narcos, I was writing more, and the more I started working after Narcos, uh, the less I wrote. So I'm taking a little bit of a little pause right now and, and getting back to the company. And um, just, you know, working on my own stuff, trying to, you know, do my own thing. When does the new season of Narcos land? Uh, wow. Uh, <laughs> September 2nd. September 2nd. Boyd Holbrook, congratulations. Thanks so much Thanks. for being here, man.